joining, but in the interest of um, everybody's time and uh, respecting that, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, this meeting tonight is being hosted by the Great Springs Project. Um, they are a 501c3 nonprofit organization formed in 2018. Um, many of you who have joined the webinar tonight are probably already aware of their mission, um, but it's, it's right there on their homepage too. And this is also a great place to learn more about the Great Springs Project in general at greatspringsproject.org. We'll be talking about a few items uh, during the presentation that are available um, through the website, such as the economic benefits report and some other resources like the survey and other tools, but um, that's just a good, um, a good page to go ahead and bookmark and uh, to keep to up to date with the project as we go. And um, my name is Jason Reyes. I'm with Alta Planning and Design, and I've been doing trail planning consulting for about 16 years now, including some work on the Violet Crown Trail a long time ago. And before that, uh, volunteering with Envision Central Texas when I was at UT Austin for planning school uh, many years ago. Also joining me is Matt Hayes with Alta Planning. He's a senior advisor on the project, and he'll be um, helping us with some Q&A as we go through the, the presentation. And um, I think with that, we could probably just go ahead and, and get rolling. Oh, one thing I wanted to say, Matt, about the Q&A. Um, anybody who's joining, um, please feel free to use that at any time. Um, and feel free to test it out right now if you want to send us a message. Just say hi, be sure it's working and everything. Um, but we want you to be using that feature throughout the presentation for any questions and comments at any time. You don't have to wait for a specific moment. We'll be monitoring those as they come in and uh, addressing them at uh, specific points in the presentation where, where we'll pause and take a look at that. We know that a lot of people joining today may, may already be aware of GSP and, and, the, and their, you know, their, mis their mission and the goals of the plan, um, but we wanted this presentation to go ahead and cover all that in case anybody is new to the process or new to, the, to learning about the organization and the planning process. So that's what this is really designed for is an introduction to that. We'll talk a little bit about the benefits analysis work that we've done for the trail plan overall. And then also um, a little bit about that, that process and the timeline for that and some next steps. So I'm going to um, navigate us through some polling questions tonight as we um, kind of go between some of Jason's presentation spots. Uh, we'll have some opportunities for you all to respond to questions. And like Jason said, please use a Q&A to ask questions along the way and provide comments. We'll have stopping points to gather those questions and answer them live. And we appreciate y'all's patience given how many people are participating. We're not able to do the back and forth dialogue, but the Q&A will be a great way to communicate. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we're going to use a polling called Mentimeter. So if you can go to menti.com, you see it there on the screen. This can be done in a browser, um, better done even on a smartphone. So if you could just open up a browser on your smartphone and go to menti.com, type in that code there, 93611683, and you'll be able to do some po uh, polling responses and we'll be able to see that in, in real time, some of the answers. Um, stays completely anonymous, so you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and go to some of the results coming in. These are icebreaker questions to start with. This is just a test out menti.com for you on your end to make sure that you know how to use it. We'll be asking more important questions later. But those of you that missed what, where to go, you can see up here at the top, um, the, the website is menti.com and the code up here as well. So you can type that code in and test it out. So our first icebreaker question is how tired of Zoom are you? If you're uh, lucky or not lucky, depending on how you look at it, you've been doing a lot of these virtual meetings and calls. And so far it looks like a lot of you are loving it. So we did this exact same public meeting last night and we had a little more people that were a little bit more tired of Zoom. So I'm glad we have a Zoom happy crowd tonight. That means we're gonna have a good time. Um, folks are a little bit tired of some of the beach backgrounds, and I hope this is my last Zoom meeting. Okay, I appreciate the honesty. That is very important that we can have that honesty tonight. <laughs> so we're going to go to our second icebreaker question. It looks like for the most part, uh, you all are participating pretty well with this. Um, so hopefully you're able to, to figure it out. So the next question, um, again, not as relevant to, to this particular project, but relevant for sure in kind of how the pandemic has impacted our lives. And so curious to see if you found yourself walking, biking, using trails more since the pandemic. 
Um, you know, I know me for one, I have seen a lot more people on trails myself in my neighborhood, but also looking at the story of data around the country where trail counters are up across the trails in Texas and elsewhere, we've seen double or triple the amount of trail use because it's been so important for people to have that, that place to go um, that's safe and they're able to get exercise and get outdoors and, and really get some peace. And so it's been very, very important. And it's in, in the pandemic, if anything has taught us, it's, it's a very important part of our day-to-day -day is having access to trails. So looks like a lot of you have been happy to explore your neighborhood. Last night, we had a lot of people who admitted they were going more to the kitchen for snacks. I've got no, none of those responses tonight. I'm glad to see you've all been getting into nature, exploring trails and some not as often as I would like. I would count myself in that category. So this is great. I'm really excited you guys have, have participated. We're gonna have some more important, interesting questions here later in the presentation. So you can keep your mentee open on your phone and we'll do some more polling later. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jason now. Thank you. And I, as we get started, I think we'll just dive right into the background and overview. And um, GSP overall, our Great Springs project has, has a very compelling vision for uh, the future of the region in terms of open space and trails. Um, they're working to create a contiguous network of greenways and over protected lands um, along the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone. And you can see on the map at right, some of those uh, destinations along the way being the four main um, Great Springs along the corridor from Austin to San Antonio, and a lot of the communities that are along the way too um, that could be connected with such a trail system. Along parallel to the, to the goal of this um, greenway system would be to also help protect 50,000 acres of additional protected lands along the uh, recharge zone. And that's working in partnership with the many organizations that are on the ground involved in this, either from the regional level or from the local level with the communities up and down the corridor. The trail itself um, is, you know, that's the whole purpose of this plan is to identify potential corridors based on that. We'll talk about that during this presentation. It's about 80 miles as the crow flies from one uh, end of it to the other, but uh, we know as the trail twists and turns and makes its way up and down the corridor, we're probably looking at something more like a hundred mile uh, trail system um, and it, with additional spurs going off of that to connect to other nearby communities or other nearby parks or, or destinations that, that are along the way. As ambitious as that is, it is completely possible. You can see some examples without even leaving Texas of where this is happening in other places. Some of them uh, three counties, some of them up to seven counties being stitched together through trail systems uh, from 100 to 245 miles. And these are just examples in Texas. There are examples all over the country of these long distance trails um, that, are, that are stitching communities together and, and connecting people in places. All of this would not be possible without the many partners, community leaders, stakeholders, and other groups that are up and down the corridor that have been doing this type of work and that uh, continue to have that as part of their mission and vision. Um, one of the things that Great Springs Project brings to the table is the vision for it as being connected and contiguous and, um, and helping coordinate partnerships, um, discussion between communities when um, you have one community maybe planning on a certain trail near their border and another one nearby, uh, maybe doing the same thing, but just to make sure that they're talking to one another and aligned in that, um, you know, in that progression is, is a big part of this as well. One of the ways that Great Springs Project started to do this was back in um, October, about this time last year. And um, they brought together different people from different communities up and down the corridor from the four different uh, counties some of them representing trail advocacy groups like Activate SA, Como Trails Alliance, San Marcos Greenbelt Alliance, and Hill Country Conservancy. And then also having um, another component of that be the, the city and, and municipality representatives who are working from either the parks side or the, the planning department side of things in terms of um, you know, planning and designing and building those trails. So these Trail Connect um, sessions and forums are a great way to um, not only for Great Springs Project to learn about what's going on in the ground and those different pieces, but also to, to share information um, among other groups as well. So we've got uh, another one of these that took place in May, and this one was focused on uh, transportation and um, economic development and what some of those larger organizations that focus on those areas um, are doing um, that relates to trails and trail development 
along the corridor. A lot of those partners that we just looked at and, and the last few slides there um, will be key partners in funding as well. So we know, for example, that the trails provide transportation benefits. And as those regional partners are planning for transportation, and as they have access to, to funding for active transportation and multimodal connections, um, we want to be sure that you know that they're aligning with the, this vision of uh, of connectivity, and um, that's one way to do that is to to look at those transportation projects as a way to to build some of this and get it funded. The other side of that coin is the conservation and open space side of things and water protection, and there's you know even with flood protection, for example, um, and mitigation. There's a lot of um, different types of sources depending on the specific project in hand, and uh, we don't see it as anything that's going to get done with any single funding source. We really see it as leveraging funding sources um, to get this built over time. So the Great Springs project overall, um, you know, to do all that coordination regarding funding and building partnerships takes a lot of work. And there's luckily there's a very good team on the board and advisory board providing direction for the process, but then also the staff that's on the ground getting things done day to day, um, work very hard to, to be able to get this thing implemented and on the ground. And they're, they're doing that groundwork right now in this planning process. And a big part of that, um, is, is looking at where do we need to start? And so one of the things they did was start with um, an equity framework process as well. And um, they, they brought in together an equity task force with a lot of different representatives from different groups up and down the corridor and started to think about what are the different themes that they need to be incorporated in the recommendations um, to make sure that equity is centered in the process overall. And you can see some of those listed here as well. So, with Alta Planning and Design's early work, um, earlier part of this year, we did a lot of data collection, a lot of looking at existing plans and routes and, um, and thinking about what are the quantifiable, measurable benefits um, of a trail system uh, such as this, and how can we measure those and communicate the value of, of this type of project, um, not only to the general public, but also to elected officials, to uh, potential funding partners, um, and uh, we, we organize that around these key themes that you see here. So looking at the economic benefits, land and water, flood protection, transportation and health, um, and trying to figure out what, is the, what are the key things that we can communicate based on what we know and what we've seen in other trail systems that have been built and how that might apply here in Central Texas. So the first thing we did in order to do that was to estimate demand so that we could apply some of these numbers to those different categories. And um, this is an estimate of demand um, projecting if the entire, once the entire corridor is built end to end, what could we expect in terms of people using that trail system? And so one way we can do that is look at similar trail systems, look at other counts of people walking and biking on trails in Texas in Austin and San Antonio, for example. We know those are two very, um, more urban um, examples. So we wanted to balance that out with, er with suburban and rural examples as well. So we drew on and supplemented with other trails in Alabama, Arkansas, the Carolinas, and Tennessee, Virginia, and other parts of Texas to really give that balance and control for the, the land use context in respect to those estimates. And you can see how that um, plays into some of the economic benefits. So we know that when people are using a long distance trail system like this, they're not always walking right out their front door, although that's certainly part of the goal here. Um, some, of, some people will be coming from either other parts of uh, the corridor, or they might even be coming from other parts of Texas or even the country. And when that happens, um, people are, you know, tend to do other spending that happens along with that trip. And so that could be um, either getting a meal before or after using the trail, it could be uh, spending time in the downtown areas that the trail connects. It could be things like renting bicycles. And for some of those people, not all of them, but for some of them, they would be staying overnight as well. And so we made an estimate on that based on trail use um, around the country as well. And you can see some of the economic impacts related to that. This has a huge benefit, not only for the, um, the, the benefit it would have for the communities up and down the corridor, but then also for the actual people that work in some of the retail and service industries up and down there, um, having uh, more business uh, related to that. Another key benefit of the trail system, of course, will be transportation. 
Not everybody will be using it for to get uh, to, to replace a car trip, but but some people will, and we can we can estimate that based on census data in terms of how many people are using um, uh, walking and biking as a means to get to work, and and knowing that some of those trips also include um, you know going to the grocery store or going to the local park or going to a friend's house or whatever it may be. We know that at least some of those trips will be offset. Uh, offsetting um, automobile trips, and that has benefits associated with it. Um, and so we're able to quantify some of that as well, looking at total transportation benefits across the system once it's built out. Health benefits is another key, key thing. We're not saying that people have to get out and be healthy and use the trail. That's not the, th the theme at all. The theme is we want to be able to pr provide access and opportunity for people to use the trail and to be healthy if that's what they wanna do and get out there. And for those people that are doing that, it's gonna have a huge impact. This total number of healthcare cost savings related to trail use is not as big as some of the other ones, but for the individuals that are being more active that are out there, they can have a huge impact on their own lives um, and their own health and well being. We know there's opportunity for improvement. If you look at what's happening in Texas overall, um, with 27% of adults and 17% of children reporting little or no leisure time at physical activity in Texas. And so we'd like to uh, just see that as an opportunity for improvement and, and somewhere where this trail can, can provide a huge benefit uh, related to health. Another big aspect of this is um, the conservation component of it. And um, when you think about the growth and development that's been happening up and down the corridor, we know that the census uh, numbers just got released for this area and it's one of the fastest growing regions in the entire country, uh, particularly in Hayes and Como counties in between uh, the urban centers. And if you look back in time from 2001 to 2016, you can see some of that growth and development happening um, uh, over those years and you can project out into the future what that might look like as well. So if we have 11% projected growth according to census figures, um, in the United States, um, and then look at what that is in Texas with 31%, a very fast growing state. This four county region is, is actually growing even faster than that. So you can might imagine what happens as, um, as you know, that population growth occurs, you're also gonna have growth in shopping centers, residential subdivisions and other things, and you need those things. But in order to um, protect the, the water source along the way too, and water quality, we've got to do that in a way that, um, that makes sense. You can see some of the impacts zooming in just north of San Antonio. This graphic is showing actual land cover data, um, you know, land changing from um, evergreen forests and deciduous forests and hay and pasture to developed areas that you see in pink and red there. And um, that's just from that one period um, from 2001 to 2016. So again, um, you, can, you can just uh, imagine what that means in terms of um, in terms of the region and, and not only in terms of uh, land developing, but in terms of losing opportunities for connecting a regional trail system um, as it gets developed. So in addition to that um, piece on land conservation and the, the benefits of that, um, water is another piece of that when you are protecting land in this region because of the uh, karst system and the Edwards Aquifer recharge zone. Um, protecting land there also means protecting water and water quality. Um, and so if we have that goal of 50,000 acres of additional protected land, um, we can project based on the land cover in the region what some of the benefits might be in terms of water quality, water supply, wildlife habitat, pollination, and even things like uh, farmland, working, working land preservation, ranches, and forest lands. And so all those things have been studied in other other studies in Texas and other studies in the United States. And so we're able to use some of those numbers and apply it to, to this region's goal of conservation um, with a potential benefit of about $19.4 million in estimated conservation benefits. So flood, flooding and flood protection, we don't see this as a benefit. We see it really as a cost that we're trying to mitigate. So one in 10 Texans are exposed to moderate to high risk riverine flooding each year. We know that in San Marcos in 2015, with the floods that happened there, that they requested up to $50 million in mitigation funds after those events. 
And we know that from the, the state flood assessment for the state of Texas, that they are anticipating 31.5 billion in statewide flood mitigation costs over the next 10 years. And some people may be asking the question, well, what does what do trails have to do with flood protection? And um, where that comes into play is, is on the conservation component that comes along with trail systems. And so if, if you're looking at it in terms of a strategic land conservation effort, it may be looking at those riparian corridors as potential natural infrastructure um, that helps slow down these catastrophic events. So anytime that you are developing land where water is supposed to flow, um, you, you're basically increasing the uh, speed and volume of that, of that water. So being strategic about that and um, growing in a way that helps protect those corridors I will have an economic benefit um, related to it. We also uh, took the extra step of trying to divide this out by county. Um, Travis County has a smaller portion of the GSP corridor in it. So that's a little bit reflected in these numbers, same with Bear County, but huge benefits in terms of what we're seeing in Hayes County and Como County um, related to you know, the amount of trail that would be going through there and the potential benefits associated with it. So that was a lot of information really fast. We wanted to cover it um, uh, succinctly, but also <laughs> with enough detail to make it worthwhile. If you want more time with that, um, go to the, the Great Springs Project dot org, and um, if you click news, uh, you can see the report link there, and um, you know read all about it. And uh, feel free to ask us questions. You can shoot those to um, to Great Springs Project team or or to any of us, and we'd be happy to talk more about it, or even talk about how uh, you know we can share that report with um, either your local government or any. Um, anybody who's working on trails in the region that, that wants to benefit from it. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, so far we've only got one question coming through the Q&A, so I wanna encourage y'all to keep get those questions coming. Um, we will address them and we'd love to hear from you. So I wanna keep encouraging y'all to do that. The one question that came in, Jason will get to in just a second, but before that, we're gonna get back to our polling. So we've got another question that should pop up on your phone or on your browser, um, the same place, minty.com. And this one takes a little bit of time, so we'll give you a little bit of time. You should, uh, we'll be able to rank what your goals are for the Great Springs Trail Plan. Now that you've learned a little more about it, what do you think are some of the, the most important goals or outcomes of the project in your mind? And, and so connectivity, increasing connectivity, so connecting our communities together, generating economic benefits, increasing access to the outdoors, so providing that opportunity for folks, improving health, um, improving safety. Didn't talk a lot about safety thus far, but giving people an opportunity to walk and bike in, a, in an area that's separate from a roadway, um, increasing livability, and then protecting water resources and natural areas as, an, as a goal. So um, you will be able to kind of rank these uh, as you kind of scroll down through your list and we'll uh, start seeing these answers populate. So um, we'll see, you know, we had this uh, same uh, public meeting last night trying to give folks an opportunity based on their schedule. Um, and we'll see how these answers end up comparing to what we saw last night. It'll be really inter interesting to see if they're aligning or if there's some, some differences. Um, I, you know, and one thing I would say about all these goals is that, you know, doing one or two of these, sometimes it, it takes care of the rest of them. So they're, they're not kind of isolated uh, goals being addressed, but they can be kind of done at the same time. So, so far, protecting water resources and natural areas is coming up big. Um, increasing access to the outdoors for all. I will tell you right now, those were our top two last night, and they're running one, two again tonight. Um, increasing connectivity is doing well there in third. Um, economic benefits is running in last, which is interesting. That's exactly what happened last night. And you know, one thing that I that I mentioned last night is the economic benefits will come as a result of doing all of these things, protecting your natural resources, increasing access, uh, people exercising more, being healthier, and spending money and coming to visit. So in many ways, the economic benefits are something that come come later. But it is interesting. I feel like these results are pretty close to what we saw last night with protecting water resources and natural areas really coming in very, very high. Um, and so this is this is neat. Wait, just maybe another 10 seconds or so. We've got a couple more responses to come in um, and then we'll get to our next question. Awesome, y'all are doing great. So let's go on to the next one now. Um, 
And so, you know, Jason talked a lot about the, the trail itself and how we want to connect the, the Great Springs, you know, being the, one of the, the priorities, but also the communities along the corridor being an important aspect of that. But, you know, as part of that, this trail can connect a whole lot more. And, um, you know, the spine of the trail or the main corridor of the trail um, can connect a number of places, but then spur trails or connector trails into communities and destinations will also be a part of this in the future. So. What, what in, um, you know, you'll be able to sort of rate these on a scale and like to see, you know, what's most important for, for you and what we try to connect. So as we're putting together the recommendations, which is our next step, what are some of the things we need to be focusing on connecting? So existing greenways and sidewalks and bike lanes, uh, parks and recreation centers, uh, schools, libraries, colleges, universities, uh, senior citizens. We know we also have an aging population. So providing access for them, uh, cultural destinations, residential subdivisions. So, you know, uh, like Jason mentioned, we have a lot of people that we hope will come. If, if you have a trail from Austin to San Antonio, I can promise you people from all over the country will come to use it. And, but a lot of the use will just be that person who lives and can walk out their front door, get right on the trail and walk a mile or two every day. And so connecting to where people already live in residential subdivisions, um, shopping centers, another possibility, and then our downtowns. We have a lot of our smaller to medium-sized towns along the corridor between Austin and San Antonio and providing that access to the downtown and those amenities. So y'all are doing great. Answers are coming in. Um, connecting to existing greenways is leading the way. Jason, I think that was the winner last night too, if I recall. So uh, similar answers, parks and recreation centers, um, you know, connecting to where people are wanting to already uh, play. Um, and recreate. recreate. Um, those are coming in high. Cultural destinations is coming in high. I don't quite remember that one doing so well, but I think that that's something we've talked a lot about and Jason will talk even more about is just the cultural heritage along this corridor and how we want to take advantage to tell that story and, and access those locations. So this is great. This is really, really helpful for us as we really move forward with our next step of of our recommendations. And Jason's gonna talk more about the next steps and the scope of work. But first he's gonna answer some of the questions that have come in. So keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, everybody. And thanks for participating. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And um, we do have some great questions coming in. So we appreciate you guys participating. Um, one of the questions is, is the Blue Ridge Parkway an inspiration for the project? What features do you imagine them sharing? Um, and what about the Appalachian Trail? And so there are some great long distance trails like those that certainly are inspiration for this. If you haven't already seen it on the Great Springs Project website, if you go to the trail section, there's a video there um, that captures some of that idea of um, how the United States does have these inspirational trails all over the country and how this corridor actually was once a trail um, a long time ago and how, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, to build on those great examples. I think as far as what they might share, Blue Ridge Parkway um, for a large component of it is a driving route. Um, it's beautiful. I've been on it plenty of times and I love it, uh, but a lot of it is centered around that sort of driving corridor. We really anticipate this being a, a walking and biking corridor more than anything. Um, as far as the Appalachian Trail, um, I'd say one way in that that, that might share some, some uh, characteristics would be in terms of those connections it makes to different communities up and down the corridor and some of the benefits it brings to those communities, um, uh, you know, some of the more rural communities especially. Only thing to add to Jason's uh, uh, that to that response about the Blue Ridge Parkway, while that is motorized, you know, I think the thing that I like to t say about the Blue Ridge Parkway is when you're on it, you just know you're on it. Um, if you ever had a chance to be there, the way that has been designed and laid out, you just know you're at a special place and you know you're on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So I think some of the consistency and design features and how it's laid out. Um, I think that's something that we'd like to bring to the Great Springs Trail. So you know you're on it when, when you're there in the future. Absolutely. Another question, um, how long will this take to finish? And uh, what could be done to build it in half the time? I'm concerned this is going to take too long. And um, there are a lot of people concerned about that too. I would agree that um, if you look, if you consider what we just went over in terms of the growth and development of the region, it's going to get harder and harder to stitch together a connected trail system. And so there is a sense of urgency around that. We also do recognize that it will, you know, we do want to uh, work with local communities as they build out their trail systems. 
And so um, we don't want to rush them necessarily, but we want to coordinate with them and help them any way that they can to, to build their sections. I think the overall goal is to have this completed by the Texas Bicentennial in 2036. And so um, that sounds like a long time from now. It is. Um, but we have seen trail systems get built um, faster. Um, Matt and I were involved in the Arkansas's uh, Razorback Greenway system, for example. It's a two county trail, about 35, 40 miles or so. And that uh, went from the initial concept in 2010 to a groundbreaking of the complete trail system in 2015. So it can be done. They had the benefit of large private investment paired with federal investment um, through transportation funds. We're hoping that we can do something similar here in terms of um, leveraging multiple funding sources. Um, but a lot of that comes back to um, public interest and political will and support. And so I think um, you know we're laying the groundwork for that right now. And I, th I think we would all like to see it be completed sooner. Another example um, or another question here, has there been um, any study on the wildlife impact, habitat impact of development? Um, they appreciated the, the visual of the red and green um, and the, the fact that we're talking about economics, but they were interested in us uh, thinking about the benefits in terms of wildlife and habitat rather than just um, dollars and cents. And so um, I, I agree with that 100%. I think the wildlife habitat and, and corridor part of that um, will will come with the trail system, but also will come with that other component of the Great Springs Project work, uh, which is going on parallel to this effort of the trail system, and that is um, the work of conservation and coordinating that conservation with other organizations for that 50,000 acres uh, goal of of, extra, of additional protected lands. And so um, we had a question last night of public access on lands like that that get conserved through, through um, efforts related to this project. and. Um, it will just depend on the, the agreements that are made with the, those landowners or those um, conservation easements. And um, some of them I would imagine would be completely uh, for protection of uh, natural resources and wildlife and others would be increasing our access to open space and trails um, as you, you know, people in central Texas um, are, are asking for that and all the studies that we're, we've been seeing. Jason, I'm going to give you a chance to take some oxygen. I think I can take this next question and then you can get the one after that. Um, Jason's doing a lot, a lot of talking, so give him a little break here. But I think this is a great question, actually. It seems like there has to be a start to build momentum, build fundraising. People need to see progress to open up their wallets. So what is the thought on the groundbreaking? I think you are really, really smart in that, in that thinking. And I think that's going to really be part of this implementation strategy that we have in the trails plan. Um, you know, Jason's talked about it a little bit. He'll talk about it more. There are already existing sections of trail that will become part of the Great Springs Trail. But as we have many wins and, and segments of projects that get built, I think you are exactly right to have ground breakings, to publicize it, to get the word out so people can see it coming together. And I think that's going to be something we try to do in this plan is identify those quick early wins and projects that can move forward quickly because I think you're right, people wanna really see the tangible result. And I think that's a really good uh, good advice for us. Absolutely. Um, so another one of these questions is, um, knowing that this project will go through sacred lands and connected sacred waters, please speak to your involvement with indigenous peoples and communities throughout the entire process. Um, we do have a steering committee um, that we put together for this plan to advise us at, um, at key steps along the way. And um, involved in that is the uh, Indigenous Cultures Institute based out of San Marcos. Um, so Maria Rocha and Dr. Garza are both sitting on our committee and um, offering guidance along the way. And we, um, we consider them a great partner for this. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the key aspects that they wanted us to communicate uh, during this process is that um, we don't wanna always speak about the Native American heritage of the corridor as something that is in the past. It's very, in fact, very present. There are still um, people up and down the corridor with Native American ancestry um, that, uh, use the, that use the Great Springs and that do pilgrimages uh, between these four Great Springs in particular. And so we wanna respect that and, um, and uh, have them involved in the process as much as possible. I believe we had one more here. Um, these are worth taking the time because this is the whole point of the meeting. Um, so uh, another question in DC and Northern Virginia, there's a fantastic 100 mile trail using the legacy railroad track. Are there 
any unused uh, rail lines not, um, sorry, are there any unused rail lines not in use to connect with? And so um, that's, that is a great example up there um, of, the, of the Washington and Old Dominion Trail that runs through Northern Virginia from um, almost from the very tip of uh, Harper's Ferry into Washington, DC. And um, those rail lines are all, you know, whenever you have an opportunity like that, it is, it is excellent to, to be able to pair with it. I think the situation we have here with the, the railroad corridors that run north south along the Great Springs corridor, um, they are very much in use. And so we, we, I don't think we're in a situation where we would have a railroad that's converted to a trail, but we, there may be opportunities to, um, to parallel with the tracks in certain situations there's never, there's not going to be any opportunities where we get a wholesale corridor where we can just go in and build the trail. It's still going to be a parcel by parcel negotiation for that ac public access and easement, um, but there may be some opportunities to parallel in some places. Monique, you've got a great question too, but just for the sake of time, we're going to hold your question for our group of questions to finish off the, the presentation. So we'll get to that one in a little bit and we'll get going uh, through uh, to conclude kind of the recommendation the, the, our scope of work and our next steps for the project. We'll have a couple more polling questions and keep more Q&A coming and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Yep, don't be shy, keep them coming. Um, so for the trails plan scope of work, I just wanted to go over the, the timeline for our Alta planning and designs work uh, with GSP for this trail planning process. So, um, you know, we started that economic benefits research earlier part of this year. Um, that report was released in June. We had a corridor tour and kickoff meeting with the project committee at that point. Um, and then we've been doing a lot of stakeholder meetings with uh, various groups and organizations up and down the corridor um, and did, began our existing conditions analysis. We're right here in September with these um, engagement meetings and with our second committee meeting. And then we'll head into October and November to uh, develop the rest of the actual uh, planning document and then hope to have that finalized and um, have some presentations on that in December, January. Um, so that's the overall scope of work. Another way to uh, sort of conceptualize that work is in terms of the actual tasks involved. And so you can see some of those here, they are basically in chronological order, but some of them overlap. Um, we're in that orange area in the middle there um, with this first round of public engagement. And um, I'll walk you through a couple more um, details on the scope in the next few slides. So for the data collection, um, always good to start with knowing what's out there today, not only the existing trails that are on the ground, but a lot of the planning work that has been done to date. It's very important for us to communicate that the Great Springs Project is not inventing this whole corridor. It's, it's something that is going on in pieces or has been going on in pieces um, up and down the corridor with the different communities um, doing their own trail planning work. And um, one of our big jobs is to start stitching those together as best we can. And so an example coming out of um, Barton Springs heading south um, to Hayes County is the Violet Crown Trail that was in 2009, 2010 was the planning work. Um, now there's existing an open trail from Barton Springs to the county line. Um, and the planning work for that goes into Hayes County and connects with the Emerald Crown Trail master plan. And that is another one that um, goes uh, from the, the border with Travis County all the way down to San Marcos. And so uh, building off of those efforts has been critical for that portion of the corridor. Heading further south, if you, if you take a look at what's going on in New Braunfels, there's been a lot of great work done for the Dry Como Creek Greenway system. And so that's following a riparian corridor and um, heading south uh, towards Schertz and towards Garden Ridge. And Schertz and Garden Ridge also have some some trails on the books too, um, particularly the shirts uh, with the, what they have as the Great Northern Trail that, um, that parallels I-35 for a bit, um, that would get us further and closer to San Antonio. And so, um, in, and even in San Antonio there, you know, with Activate SA and the, all the groups that are working down there, there are some plans and ideas for how we might be able to connect um, down to San Antonio Springs. Other groups that may, be, um, may not have a trail plan in place or may not be building trails themselves are involved in things related to it. So from the cultural side of things, I just mentioned the Indigenous Cultures Institute, but also El Camino Real de los Tejas uh, has a corridor that has been in place, not just for this part of Texas, but it actually goes uh, quite, a, quite a ways in each direction from this corridor 
um, and it's a national historic trail that we could um, you know, parallel with and maybe even uh, coordinate on sections where we want to tell that story along with, along with the corridor itself. Other partners, um, you know, ranging from river authorities to conservation groups to transportation organizations and bike, bike advocacy, um, all bringing something to the table in terms of their direction on our steering committee and, and in terms of their direction as stakeholders up and down uh, the corridor. Speaking of the corridor, in order to estimate our economic benefits, we had to um, start stitching together um, our best guess earlier on on what a trail alignment might look like based on all those existing plans I just mentioned, and then all the gaps that are in between them. And so what you're seeing here is really conceptual and uh, the draft alignments uh, being in progress will really be based on what the local plans and preferences are for those. And so this gave us a, a sort of draft concept to work with but it also allowed us to begin that uh, important step of collecting the geographic information systems data, the actual line work of those existing plans throughout the region um, to start stitching them together basically. Along with that, we um, talked to people about those plans, about how they came about, about what the, what's realistic in them, what's not realistic, um, we met with them on the ground for different portions of that and talked about what the opportunities and constraints were in real life on the ground, not only with what's being planned, but with what's been built already and, and the opportunities and challenges that they ran into with those segments so that we can all learn from them and share them with each other um, so that we can benefit from, from all that to move this together faster. We also took a corridor tour. We had a couple um, planners from Alta Planning and Design start from the city of Austin and bike their way down to San Antonio. Um, I think we have some stats on that later, but I think the main thing is that we wanted to understand the corridor more from the user's perspective in terms of what we're seeing from those existing portions that may be side paths along highways, like you see on the left, to natural surface trails with crushed granite, to sections that are really on road and um, maybe more challenging and, um, and less ideal, but nonetheless important for some key connections that might not be available elsewhere. The other thing that we benefited from, from being on the ground was seeing things that are not readily apparent from either um, aerial photography or Google Earth or Google Street View. Um, as up to date as those things go, uh, they, they don't always capture everything that's happening on the ground. So being able to see these opportunities and constraints on the ground really helped us have a better understanding of the corridor. All in all, in about five days, we covered about 134 miles on bike from end to end and um, had uh, almost 200 miles driven back and forth just trying to see everything that is not, um, you know, that is not accessible by bike as well. And so, uh, really getting a sense of the lay of the land of this corridor, um, getting a good photographic inventory of those opportunities and constraints along the way. You can see from the list here, we had quite a bit of fuel consumed um, to get us going on that, and even had a chance to you know, see some wildlife, um, including the, the bats emerging north of San Antonio. That week uh, in June concluded with a kickoff meeting where we had our uh, committee meetings, our committee members uh, join us from di representing different organizations up and down the trail corridor and different local governments. And we laid out maps of the entire system uh, based on what we had been able to collect from them um, digitally. And then started that process of, you know, looking at, well, what's realistic? What, um, what should we, what are we not looking, have we not been looking at or has not been in a past plan that should be uh, considered? And that really, um, that's, that's really fueling a lot of our uh, development of the draft plan so far. Um, and so it's been really beneficial to have everybody's input on that. The next steps for the trail plan. We um, talked a lot about the vision earlier in this presentation. We talked about some of the challenges and um, uh, those, are been, those have been documented in a draft of those chapters one and two. And then what we're working on right now is the planning work that I just talked about in terms of the actual uh, draft alignments. So that would be chapter three of the plan. And then chapter four will be that implementation piece identifying what the path forward is. Um, hopefully, like the commenter earlier said, um, sooner than later. This is just a sample slide of some of the mapping that is in the existing conditions chapter, uh, talking about that um, you know, growth and development that we mentioned earlier, talking about the natural resources up and down the corridor, 
we have another map not shown here that has the, the cultural resources and historical destinations and landmarks along the way. Um, the map on the right is our outdoor recreation draft map um, showing some of the gaps um, in access to the outdoors up and down the corridor. And um, yeah, this is just a recap slide, just those next two chapters being the next things we're working on. As we look at that planning process in terms of the trail itself, we are um, relying a lot on the work that we've done in many other places and um, have been seeing across the country emerge as a best practice in terms of these long distance trails. And um, a couple of those things are outlined here, prioritizing a sense of place, reflecting that community heritage, um, connecting to everyone um, and, and the except, exceptional landscapes that are up and down the corridor and the economic benefits that come along with that as well, which we talked quite a bit about. Creating a common ground for all, we know that there are different uh, desires for the trail system. Some people may want to be biking on it um, from end to end. Some people may want to be hiking for a small portion of, of the corridor and others may just want to have access to the outdoors and um, and uh, peace in nature. And so there's many different things that people want out of this and we want to recognize that as it's being designed. Um, and we wanna do that to a high standard, looking at not only um, you know, what it means to have a, a quality trail system with quality materials and, um, and things to interact with, but also in terms of making it safe and in terms of looking at those trail crossings with roadways and being sure that those are being done to the highest standard for safety. Finally, um, with this project in particular, um, the promotion of environmental stewardship is a key component over the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone. Overall next steps for the process, and then we'll get back to Matt here. We just went over this, so no need to spend too much time on it, but into October and November, um, we'll have a second round at some point of, of outreach and engagement. Um, we're hoping that can be in person uh, for the next round, but we'll have to see how everything unfolds. This is the second meeting of two for right now. And so we're glad to have everybody participating in this. Um, we have some more time left to go into more questions. So I don't wanna to spend too much time um, on that. But the one thing I did want to uh, emphasize is that we do have a survey on the Great Springs Project website, greatspringsproject.org. There's a survey link right on the homepage there. And we would encourage you all to go ahead and take that. We know that you've been participating in this meeting and we do appreciate that. But um, the survey itself will be important in addition to your participation here today, because we do ask some different questions. And we also, um, there are some open ended questions there as well that we want your input on. Um, and uh, to the extent to which you can share that survey with others, um, of course, we would appreciate that as well. We have hard copy versions of this. We have ver a version in Spanish that we're, um, we'll have available very soon. So if anybody um, wants to request any of those, please contact us and we'd be happy to provide those. And then all the other ongoing engagement efforts listed here, I won't read them all, but um, one of the important ones there is the fact that the Great Springs Project does support local communities to the extent to which they want the support for their trail workshops, newsletters, and public engagement tools. Uh, example there from the City of Kyle open house in June, and um, we know that you know, there's another open house tonight as well for the Alligator Creek Corridor in New Braunfels. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities that are happening locally up and down the corridor that the Great Springs Project can play a role in, in supporting those as well. So it's not just our meetings, it's the meetings that are happening up and down the corridor. Great, Jason. Well, we are to our last polling questions and we're 10 till six local time there. And I think the uh, news to share with you is we're gonna be finishing right on time. So we've only got about 10 minutes left. So stay, stay with us a little bit longer. We appreciate y'all participating thus far. Um, and to Jason's point about the survey and to the question earlier about, you know, groundbreaking and building momentum. I think if you're a supporter of this project, the more you can spread the word about the website and to get people participating in the survey, the better off the project will will have for success. So definitely encourage you all to drive people to that website and to to get input and and get people engaged. So two more polling questions, and then we'll get to the rest of the questions that have come in um, to kind of build on the public engagement question. What do you all think from your perspective there on the ground will be some of the best ways for us to focus continued public engagement? Um, we'd really like to get some guidance as to about, you know, how do we do this in the right way and reach the most people? So 
one, like Jason mentioned, there's already a lot of local community work happening um, along the corridor for trails, so providing them support, um, announcements via social media, um, additional webinars and online meetings like this, um, local and regional news articles and interviews, so kind of getting this out in the in, um, regular media uh, that's out there today. Tabling, so you know, maybe going out to where people already are along trails or at events, so setting up a table to get the information out. Focusing on um, engagement with underrepresented communities. And if you have other ideas, please uh, list them in the Zoom QA. I believe we only give you all one option here. So we're, we're really trying to get you to say what is the, the number one thing we should focus on. So appreciate the answers coming in. This, similar to last night, is you know, supporting and kind of building on the local initiatives and what local communities are already doing. I think that's a, a really good idea. And I think something that's really kind of the foundation foundational to this project uh, to begin with. Um, social media is good. That's how people are communicating nowadays for better or worse. Um, we'll leave that uh, word better or worse conversation alone, but social media is a way to get to a lot of folks. Um, some traditional media, I think we heard a good bit of this last night too, is using our, our news um, and uh, those types of uh, opportunities to get the word out. And then a couple of other votes for uh, focusing on engagement with underrepresented communities and then tabling. Um, at, at, a, at a local event. So I don't think we're gonna be doing just one of these. It's gonna be comprehensive in nature, but this gives us an idea of what, what may work the best. And so we appreciate this. So this is um, the last polling question for the night. And this is an open-ended one. So we'd love for y'all to participate in this one. I've got some really compelling answers last night, but um, from your perspective, what is um, success look like for the Great Springs Trail from your perspective? Um, I'd be really interested in kind of knowing like big picture, what does this trail mean to you? What does success look like for you with a future trail on the ground? And how, how, does, that, how does that look? Um, Jason, I'm seeing voting is closed on this. I hope that's not actually the case, but I guess we'll find out here in a second in case answers come in. Matt, while you, uh, if you want to take a look at that on your end, I can go through some of the Q and A for a little bit, if you like. I think I just figured. I think I just figured it out. I think I opened it up, so hopefully you all are able to see this question now. I don't know why it went to close, but, but yeah, we'd love to get your open-ended response on what success looks like for you. But as you're doing that, I think that's a great idea, Jason, to go ahead and go through your okay. questions. Great, wonderful. Um, yeah, we've got a. a a great set of uh, new questions that came in. So one of them is, what is the role of the National Park Service? So uh, the Great Springs Project uh, received a grant from them for recreational trails, uh, trails assistance. And what that means is that um, they have a staff person assigned to this project that is able to pro provide guidance on um, what's been successful for uh, trail systems in other parts of the country and what the National Park Service brings in terms of their expertise for uh, park management, maintenance, for uh, uh, trail right-of-way acquisition and things like that. And so what their primary role for now is during this planning process is um, to provide some support for uh, a lot of the outreach that's going on and a lot of the engagement that will happen. Um, and so um, having them involved in that, that respect and serving on the steering committee has been extremely helpful. Um, another question is, have you considered extending to hot wells in South San Antonio? Is there, um, it's an area in need of development and would allow greater access. And so one way in which that could happen is by GSP connecting to San Antonio Springs. We at that point would be connected in um, with the Howard Peak Greenway system. And um, the Howard Peak Greenway system then would make uh, the best uh, the, the best effort in terms of connecting down to hot wells from there. And that's true for any one of our systems. So if you flip the coin and went up to Austin and talked about, you know, connecting to the Violet Crown Trail system, that would also get you to Town Lake and to um, a lot of the, the trails that are around there and into the Austin system of parks and trails as well. So um, someone asked, um, I might have missed this, but um, how is, how is, let's see, I might have missed this, how is this work being funded? And so uh, from the funding perspective, we, we covered that a little bit in a slide talking about um, some of the state uh, funding sources, some of the federal funding sources, um, and even uh, looking at private, nonprofit, and local funding. And so um, the way that that would happen is not from any single source, but from leveraging those different sources, depending on the particular project. So if it was transportation-based, that might be something like a raise grant through the federal government, 
or it might be something like uh, MPO, or Metropolitan Planning Organization funding for um, active transportation. Um, if it was more of an open space natural surface area or natural surface trail, it might be something that comes along with uh, some of the water quality protection grants and, and other things. So it really depends on this particular segment that's in question as far as the funding is concerned. Another um, question is about um, how this works with all the different jurisdictions. So the, the question of um, will the counties have jurisdiction over the trails and you know, providing management of them and, and supervision. And um, the way this works with a lot of national or not a lot of regional trail systems in the US where it crosses multiple jurisdictions is that the local jurisdiction for their segment of it would retain um, operations and management for that portion. And so they would also be in control of what the rules and regulations are regarding that. The way that Great Springs Project can play a role in that is um, providing some overarching guidance uh, that they could consider and could, could um, coordinate with others on. So that might come in terms of a memorandum of agreement in terms of maintenance, in terms of design standards and things like that. And so our plan will have some recommendations for how that um, could unfold here and, um, and how it's unfolded in other places as well. Awesome. Well, we've got some great responses coming in and I'll highlight some of these. Hopefully you all are seeing these scrolling across your screen, but getting it done by 2036. I thought it was really cool last night. We had someone say, you know, get it done by 2036 when I turn 90, wants to be out there walking on the trail when they turn 90 years old. And I thought that was pretty cool. So some similar thinking is the desire to get it done. Um, you know, I'm seeing a good bit about the, the cultural heritage that we talked about, the sacred nature of the springs, the, you know, kind of respect of nature and, and all those elements that I think is, are really important. Um, the, you know, kind of the making more healthy the connection between those that have settled here and indigenous people's lands and waters. I think this is a, a good theme that we're seeing tonight. Um, the protection of natural resources and wildlife. Getting people out of their cars, that's a, a, a good one. That's a new one we saw too that has a positive impact um, for sure. Um, you know, I think another one I saw was just connectivity. And then uh, one I think that was interesting too was just guidance and leadership that listens to the needs of the community. So cultivating those relationships. And I think that is really important. And, and kind of another foundational theme that I'm seeing with the Great Springs Project Initiative in general is is listening to folks on the ground, their community, to their community needs and in respect with landowners too, and talking to them about all the potential benefits for them and their legacy and the town and their community and what they need today and how the trail can be a part of that. I think that's a really good point and a new one that um, makes a lot of sense and really fits into what we're doing. With some comments that are still coming through, this is great. This is all um, stuff that we're gonna be using going forward in our planning process. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciate all this input. I just want to um, make an observation that a lot of uh, what I'm seeing here in terms of um, the comments that are that are being submitted and the, the perspectives, um, I really appreciate them because I can tell by the way that a lot of them are written that they are they're very intentional, very well said and well worded and um, we know that these are anonymous, but we would love to put some of these in the plan in terms of quotes that we heard at this public meeting uh, so that that can be reflected right in the plan itself. Um, so thank you all for taking the time um, to do that. I know it's very easy to attend a webinar and just sort of passively listen um, in the background, but I can tell that um, you all are paying attention and engaged and we appreciate that. All right, well, I think that brings us uh, to right at the top of the hour. Again, thank you for your time. If anybody has any further questions or comments, maybe take a screenshot of this or maybe just take a moment to jot it down. We'll leave the screen up for a little bit if you need to grab a pen and paper, but um, feel free to contact any of us, um, Gary, Lita, and Emma there uh, with the Great Springs Project or myself with Alta. And um, if we don't know the answer to your question, we will direct it to the right person and find out for you. So. Um, uh, please uh, continue to stay engaged, look out for our next meetings um, in the coming months, and um, thank you again for participating. Thanks, everybody. Stay well.